God is good. And all the time, we are so thankful that God has drawn us together to be gathered around uh, his gifts, the gift of his word and the sacrament of the altar this day, but also the gift of his people. Uh, Just to welcome you that are uh, watching us online, uh, whether you are live or watching us later. Uh, I challenged the congregation a few minutes before we came on to look at the bulletin cover. Uh, As my bulletin covers fit the theme of what I'm preaching in the sermon. Uh, The sermon is the epistle text in 1 Corinthians 2. It's about wisdom. Uh, Luann, some people made comments, I should have only had three pictures for the three wise men. (laughs) We are in Epiphany. No. Um, Betty was doing a pretty good job. She she got three of them. does, that, does anybody know the top left? Confucius. I figured you'd get that one. Um, anybody know the bottom right? Very good. It's Freud. Bottom right is Freud. Uh, bottom left. He's famous for saying God is dead. Nietzsche. Very good. And then the one at the top the top right is, it could be one of several of them. I, I chose it because of something that he said that we were taught at the seminary. Anybody know top right? As you can see, there are several guesses here. Plato. Plato is the, is the one. So, so as, as, as Jill said, these guys are much wiser than us. And I would say it depends on what you call wisdom. And as you hear in the message today... Um, we are wiser. We are wiser. And so, again, as we gather around the word today, let that word just resonate among you. Uh, Just a few announcements before we get started. Next Sunday after worship, we're going to have a very brief congregational meeting. Uh, uh, We we want to take advantage of the opportunity to nominate uh, people for the uh, role of synod president. Synod First Vice President and our Synod Regional Vice President. Um, It's important to take that position because based on the number of nominations is who gets placed on the ballot. Uh, And uh, Ralph and myself are, I'm the pastoral representative and Ralph is the the congregational representative in that vote when that that roster gets completed. So we want to have a very brief voters meeting. Um, It'll take... Five minutes tops, uh, just to approve uh, who we want to nominate. Uh, Sign-ups for the Lenten soup and bread dinners are in the narthex. You're not signing up to attend. You're signing up to prepare. Uh, just want to make that clear. Uh, so, so if you can help in the preparation of the soup and or bread, there are those sign-ups for all the uh, Lenten uh, Wednesday meals Uh, which start February 22nd. So we're just two and a half weeks away. Also, you should have received an email notification from our food bank. Uh, Our food bank is uh, low on supplies, and they are in in need of financial donations. Uh, So if you want to take advantage of that opportunity, I know we have some funds that we designate that way, but if any of you feel in your heart uh, to give, uh, in that regards, because they are able to go shopping and get uh, uh, more, sort of more bang for the buck uh, as they do their shopping. So if, if you so choose to do that, please do so. So as uh, God has gathered us together this day, we take some time for the Holy Spirit to mold and shape our hearts and minds for our worship this day. In prayerful meditation, either contemplate on a scripture passage or on one of the hymns Or let the Spirit guide your prayer as the candles are being lit and the prelude is being played.
As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. And as our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has brought us to the waters of our baptism, uh, to delight not only in the faith that we have, but also to receive the word and the sacrament this day, we begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite the congregation to please stand for the singing of the hymn. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you the of my sin. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor miserable sinner, Confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh Lord, keep your family, the church, continually in the true faith, that relying on the hope of your heavenly grace, we may ever be defended by your mighty power. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. 
The congregation may be seated.
first reading is from the Old Testament reading of Isaiah. Why have we fasted and you see it not? Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it? Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure and oppress, oppress all workers. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose a day for a person to humble himself? It is to bow down his head like a reed and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him. Will you call this a fast and a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I choose to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke? to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke. It is not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house. When you see the naked, to cover him, and not to hide yourself from your own flesh. Then shall the light break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, Here I am. The epistle lesson comes from the second chapter of 1 Corinthians. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message was not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Yet among the mature, we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age, who are doomed to pass away. But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understand this, for it is they that they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him, these things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God, for which, for who knows a person's thought except the Spirit of that person which is in him? So also, no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now he has received not the Spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we may understand the things freely given to us by God. And we impart this in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have mind, the mind of Christ, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the fifth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. 
In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. The congregation may be seated. Grace, peace, and mercy from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, Just a little background. Uh, Many of you probably already know that there is some conflict between Paul and the congregation at Corinth. And uh, and as we have received two letters, uh, there are some uh, biblical scholars that say there are more letters to the people of Corinth. Um, You might want to say they were a hot mess. And, and the thing is, it's, it's difficult to figure Paul out because even in the opening chapters, he's already addressing the problems, and, and you don't know what the problems are. Well, I will tell you, with, with what's going on here in chapter 2, there is an elitist attitude and allegiance going on among some of the members of the, of the congregation at Corinth. And it's creating some disagreement, and it's creating division, which he talks about later in, in this letter. And, and what's happening is there are those in, in the congregation that feel that they are spiritually superior to those that are within their own small groups, so to speak. They had house churches not only meeting in the temple, but meeting in individual homes. So some of them thought that they were spiritually superior to some within their small groups. But also they felt that they were spiritual superior among other Christians. So Paul is pleading to them to become united in mind and in purpose, to become united in wisdom and proclamation. And I know we in the church today, we have no problem with any members or churches thinking that they have an elitist attitude, thinking themselves more superior than other people sitting in the pews. That doesn't happen today, does it? Because it's all in a matter of how we look at wisdom. And Jill, I'm glad you said that this morning because that is so... What we have to grab onto is how do we how do we look at wisdom? Because as the world looks at it, wisdom is the possession of a higher knowledge. And I've heard that said about me because I'm the pastor, so I've got a higher knowledge, so I'm a little closer to God. You better laugh at that. <laughs> Or shake your head or roll your eyes. But it's not just merely possessing higher knowledge that that our culture, that our society thinks. It's also the expression of a higher knowledge. That when you do express that higher knowledge, it comes with a certain eloquence. It comes with some polish. It comes with some power. And if we, if we get sucked in by the way culture defines wisdom, we also get sucked into what we've been seeing over the last several years, that we get caught in this trap of debate rather than discussion. How many people have been argued into heaven? 
But if we look at, the, at wisdom as the way the world does, it becomes more about a debate rather than a conversation that we have with people. And, 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 and as we do, we get, we get caught in an allure that somehow we get allured by the, the reliance upon reason, upon senses, upon persuasion. That all it takes is to dazzle people, dazzle people with a, with a turn of a phrase, dazzle people with a cliché. Somehow we get caught up in, in being, ad, being, being admirers of somebody who displays their intelligence for us. And boy, if they add a sense of humor, an acute story, that's the pastor I want. Yeah, there was a pastor just the other day that shared with me uh, as, as one of the members was le leaving his congregation. And the, the, the member said, Pastor, that was a great sermon. And he asked, well, what made it great? You know that story about the chicken? Yeah, uh, it's the intelligence wrapped in stories, humor, cliches, the turn of a phrase. And somehow people get baffled by the brilliance or something else. And things get a little blurry. And so we cry out, just make it easy. Can't you dumb it down for me? Just tell me that my simple outward signs are enough. Patrice, thank you for the reading of the Old Testament lesson today because we need to hear that again because it's a conversation between God and the people. And, and they thought that it was just enough for simple outward signs. Isaiah 58. The people ask, why have we fasted and you see it not? Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it? And God answers them. Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure and oppress all your workers. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose? Will you call this a fast? Will you call this a day acceptable to the Lord? No, this word that we hear, this word that we speak, this word that we live is not some sort of fancy speech. And there are times when it makes no sense whatsoever. Because as Paul tells us in the text, it's not the wisdom of men, but it's the power of God. I desire to know nothing along with you than Jesus Christ and him crucified. I desire to know nothing else among you than Jesus Christ and him crucified. 
That's God's proclamation to the church. That's God's proclamation to you and me. It's all about Jesus, his death, and his resurrection. That's God's intervention into this age, into this world, when he sent his son to roam the earth, not just as a brilliant teacher, which other faiths think, but no, it was Jesus to come to suffer, to die, to rise again, so that we may be able to be joined together in relationship with our Heavenly Father. It's God's intervention into this age. As he interweaves the ministry that all already was accomplished in Jesus himself. And the spirit at work in us. It's the cross that is linked with our hearing and our seeing. It's the cross that that is linked with a changed mind and a transformed heart. And it's this word of God, this strong word of God, that creates and nurtures and sustains our faith for each and every day. Because it's this word that makes known to us the mind of God in Christ, through the Holy Spirit. This word is salvation revealed. But even more so, it's salvation that is unleashed in your life and my life. Because as the word gets into us, it it undergirds and guides And it undergirds and guides our belief, our message, and our ministry. And what God does in his word is he bestows and exercises his mind within us. And as he, as he bestows and exercises his mind within us, then he bestows and exercises his gifts among us, for us, through us, to be sent into the world so that others may know what wisdom truly is. Not a bunch of heady thinkers. Because guess what? You know what these guys are? Dead. And as one of them One of them himself proclaimed, God is dead, uh, wrong. So now God bestows and exercises his mind and his gifts within and around and among and through each and every one of us. And that becomes our work of witness. You might say... You know, that's, I can't. Yeah, you can. Because it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. A simple word. Jesus Christ and him crucified. A shared mission that God has given to this congregation to come together to do for the sake of this community. And as I read in the gospel reading, as he told the disciples, he tells you and me, you are the salt of the earth. Not you will be, you are the salt of the earth. So accentuate Jesus Christ in all that you say and do. You are the light of the world. So illuminate Jesus in all that you say and do. Because it's not purely just the words that we speak. But it's also the lives that we live. 
for the glory of God our Father. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, and the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Almighty God, we give you thanks for your liberating word made known especially in the light shining through the glorious cross of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Grant that your word enlighten our hearts and minds now that we may keep it and bring forth the fruits of faith in all that we say and do. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. By your light of life, rule and govern your whole church throughout the world that all those who proclaim your truth be preserved in the pure doctrine of your saving word, and that faith and love may be strengthened and increased in all your people. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Bless our country and all who are in authority. Let your glory dwell in our land, that mercy and truth, righteousness and peace may abound everywhere. We commend to you the care of our schools so that our children grow in useful knowledge and Christian virtue, bringing forth wholesome fruits of life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort all who are in trouble, sickness, anguish, or any other adversity. Especially today, we pray for Jordan, Laura, Dax, Paul, Al, Adam, McKenna, June, Stephen, and Kit. Grant courage and strength to all who suffer for your name's sake. In every time of trouble, show yourself a very present help, the Savior of all, Lord in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Accept, we pray, our bodies and souls, hearts and minds, all our talents and powers together with the offerings we bring before you as our humble service. Help us to prepare for the world to come, doing the work you have given us to do while it is day before the night comes when no one can work. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for the hymn.
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. Amen. Amen.